I'm Ros Malincina, the Chief Communications Officer for the Library of Congress. We thank you so much for your time and your patience for waiting for all of us tonight, but we promise you a very exciting evening. So um, we think this is the perfect um, partnership between CBS and GOES and the Library of Congress. As you probably, among everybody here in the audience, who has never been here before? Well, we're hoping through tonight's conversation, you'll learn more about the Library of Congress. When I mention that it's a good partnership because GOES pretty much showcases America's history. And you're in the largest library in the world with most of America's treasures. We've had the cast here all day. We showed them items from the collection and we showed them items that are based on their character. So I know you wanna see them, you're not here to look at me. So let's welcome the cast of GOES. We have five ghosts with us. Um, you know him as Sasapis. Welcome, Roman Zaragoza. You know her as Alberta. Welcome, Daniel Pinnock. You know him as your, the most lovable Pete out there, Richie Moriarty. Please welcome the woman of the house. You know her as Hetty, Rebecca Wasaki. And of course, the youngest ghost, you know him as Trevor, Asher Grodman. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Wow, wow, wow. We should mention, though, <laughs> Tonight's episode was very Alberta-centric, uh, so we want to welcome El um, Danielle's mom here. So, Mama Jo! Woo! Stand up! Stand up! Stand up! So we have a lot to talk about. So, oh yeah, baby. So <laughs> this season premiered with more than 13 million viewers. And um, the streaming service on Paramount has attracting more audience members. Why do you think this show has resonated with so many viewers for the past three years? I definitely feel like this show is, we are everyone's family members. You know, all of these ghosts are friends that you know or people that are in your family. Alberta's definitely somebody's grandmama from back in the day. And we were really bringing these black and white photos to life that you may see in your homes. It's also, I feel like we're bringing broadcast TV back. You know, it's fun, right? Um, it is, this is a show that's fun for the whole family. It's just hilarious and heartwarming and there are some really tearful moments as well too and so I'm honored to be on this show I've waited my whole career 20 plus years to be on something this iconic and it's finally happening and I'm so grateful to be with these good folks here I mean it's fantastic I'll say too like I think part of part of it for me the attraction from the very beginning when I first read the script is that it is this true ensemble comedy right like we are literally traveling through this mansion as a clump of ghosts from room to room so uh, it reminds me of sitcoms that I grew up with that were you know that were cheers and you know home improvement and like other like real ensemble comedies I think that's what attracted me to it and that's why it's very fun for us to do you know we're we're lucky that we're doing this with people we actually enjoy being with. Uh, we love each other, and it's, it's been so fun to do as a group. And I think something about when it is an ensemble comedy with this large of a cast is you, one particular storyline, you get a sense of one character, but you get to have these little tastes of what's going on with the other characters. We're always leaving you wanting more uh, as we tell these stories. So it, it just, it's a great little grouping. How about you, Roman? So. Oh, um... <laughs> You're the oldest ghost here without Thor, so. That, that's true, yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing. I think we've been talking a lot about um, the show today, and, and we, you know, we'll dive into, like, what we did today, but we got to see some really beautiful curated items from, like, our time periods and things like that, and, and it made me really see the diversity in our show, not just, um, just with the actors, but showing the different storylines and seeing how 
we're having diversity in time periods. So we have a character from the 1500s hanging out with a jazz singer from the 20s and uh, a Wall Street guy. And and it's just so fascinating to see that diversity as well. And, and I think that's why we can, uh, the, our demographics just are massive. You know, we have children, my, my little cousin watches it, he's six, to, you know, people, I don't know. We just we go beyond what I have ever thought. When we were making the show, of season one, we had no idea that this would be uh, the reach, and we just owe it all to everyone who watches it and the fans. It means so much to us because we have a lot of fun making it, and and maybe that's also what shows is like we truly love each other. We truly have a good time. So um, I'm just grateful that y'all like the show too. I, I do love that you said your 60 year six year old nephew watches it. Like, yeah, he does. Does yeah. he say um, the S off? <laughs> Honestly, my, my cousins who are, you know, um, his parents, he, uh, they, they just get a crack out of all the things that he'll, yeah, yeah, oh my God, sucked off, sucked off. They're like, you, you have no idea. You have no idea what you're talking about. And I love it. Um, um, which is fun about the show, you know, there's things that are gonna go over kids' heads and, and, um, and then the parents are just gonna have a good time, so. <laughs> One wonderful thing about the show um, is, um, you know, you could have all easily played it with the stereotypical, you know, characters uh, that you're portraying, but you've all done, done such a great job being more well-rounded with so much heart, um, especially you, um, Rebecca, your character, Hetty, has grown so much in the past three years. So. You could say that she's had the very farthest to come, though. <laughs> Why, what do you think is there to learn from an average viewer of you know, all these different personalities living under one roof? Well, I think the th one thing that is felt very remarkable to me lately uh, is um, it, it, seldom do you get the opportunity to see the perspective of someone who's had the benefit of hundreds or in some cases thousands of years of retrospect on their own life, on their own situation and the opportunity to uh, grow from that, to, 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 to see the mistake, to, to learn from it only in concert with their friends, uh, people whose viewpoints and, and uh, you know, that would have never come across in their own lives and their own times. And only through those relationships are they able to see you know, the error of their ways and the mistakes that they made in their own lives and to feel a little bit better about them. Of course, you know, we, we, we take two steps forward and Hetty takes five steps back. You know? So so she, she fancies herself a feminist, but she still thinks, you know, child labor is pretty cool, and so is cocaine. <laughs> Speaking of cocaine, I guess um, <laughs> one of the items we weren't able to show you this more, um, today was we have Sigmund Freud's um, A Vial of His Cocaine. Um, I was, yes. So, but that, <laughs> but let's talk about the collection. Here I, it I is. didn't steal it. <laughs> Let's talk about some of these collection items that you guys saw. Let's start with you, Roman. Um, we showed items from the Lenape tribe, um, and one of our curators actually is a descendant from that. Um, what did it mean to you to see all these collections, and what did you learn that you could bring to your character? Um, well, firstly, it was incredibly, like, and surprisingly emotional. I, um, uh, Meg, who was our amazing curator today, is, is Muncie, and so her family, um, her, or her ancestors were kicked out from their homelands to where Sass like grew up, like in the Hudson Valley and like, you know, or in Manhattan, otherwise known as Manhattan now, right? And and they, um, the Lenape people were either sent to and, and moved west to Wisconsin or to Canada where her family is uh, in like London, um, Ontario, or some people went to like Delaware and the Delaware tribes. Um, oh, forgive me, this is a lot. But, um, but uh, some went to Oklahoma too. And so it was interesting to hear about her side of the family and and she was talking about a lot of this stuff as if it, you know, all the, all the artifacts and all the things. And we saw maps of what Manhattan looked like before the uh, the right when the Dutch got there, and then 30 years 30 years later, and then another 30 years, and just seeing at the evolution of this island that was indigenous to just being completely stripped of the the Muncie of the Lenape people, and how I just got so emotional. And then she talked about how. Her family was sent to residential schools and talking about how the impact is today. Like how we went from here 
of uh, the the Dutch arriving to where we are today. And then for her to be standing there, she's like, yes, there's a lot of sadness. Yes, there's a lot of weight and heaviness to this history. But also, I want you to remember the resilience because I'm standing here in front of you. I am Muncie. I'm a storyteller just like Sasapis. And I'm here today working at the Library of Frickin' Congress. <laughs> so I, I, that's amazing to me. Danielle. Um, our music division was able to show you an array of sheet music. Could you tell the audience what you saw today? Um, well, first of all, DC, I'm looking out into the audience and y'all are a good looking bunch. First of all, I meant to say that. I meant to say that before, y'all look good, first of all, okay. But I have to say, off of uh, Rahman, is that from generational curses, we can be the generational blessing, mm -hmm. right? Um, looking at those materials today, I just, the thought was, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. You know, my, um, my family is Jamaican, and they immigrated here during the civil conflict um, at the time, and there was a lot of things that were lost during that time. And so, I mean, even just, I used to go into people's homes when I was younger and just be like, oh my gosh, I don't have any baby pictures of my grandmother and stuff like that. And so, to see these artifacts today, it was like I was getting a little piece of home. Like we saw Duke Ellington's first uh, sheet music, which was unreal. Um, we learned about um, another Alberta jazz singer and who the character is probably based off of and that her best friend was Langston Hughes. And so it was so funny hearing that because season one, all of my improvs when we were filming would be about me and Langston Hughes being best friends. And so I had no idea that that was actually the case. <laughs> Uh, I was like, okay, can we get some of the guest stars Langston in season four? I'm ready, okay, Raising in the Sun. Um, so <laughs> but it was, it was unreal and so special, and I'm so grateful that we all got to experience all of our um, generations today. It was fabulous. Richie, um, this is like coming home for you. You, you went to school in Rockville, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Rockville, Maryland, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, you're pretty much a local like the rest of us. So I was very impressed with our curators, what they were able to show you and Asher. Um, you know, because we kind of can expect what they're going to show the three of them, but what are they going to show Pete and Trevor? You know, could you tell the crowd um, what they showed you? Yeah, I mean, so Pete's got a lot of different interests, including Dungeons and Dragons. So there are a lot of like, <laughs> what? You're kidding. Uh, so there were a lot of like D&D &D books, like early D&D &D books that they pulled. They, there were a lot of comic books, and they talked a little bit about like the vast comic book collection here at the Library of Congress. There was also, Pete is also a traveler agent, uh, or travel agent, sorry. And so there was, um, they had this manual that basically trained travel agents uh, from back in the day. There's also like, th like, there was some heavy history stuff, but there was also like a lot of sense of humor, I think like in some of the items they brought in, including the cocaine. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, we have an episode, I think from season two, where, um, where Thorfinn, Pete, and Nigel are watching a colony of ants. It's like how they're passing the time in the barn. And so there was a book that they found called Ant Watching, and it was literally like <laughs> how to observe a colony of ants. So there were little fun things like that that they would pull from single episodes and kind of pepper in, which was really nice. I mean, it was incredible. It was such a fun day that way. I mean, you're not going to mention about the archery manual that they Oh showed. my gosh, of course. <laughs> there was a lot of like, like how to avoid getting hurt on the archery range. Uh, yeah, I forgot about the archery stuff. There's there so much great stuff. And I do want to say like about Rockville, so I'm not the only cast member from that went to high school at Wooten. Uh, Utkarsh also is a Wooten High School graduate from Rockville. And, uh, his, and then his and his parents are here tonight. They're right here. Hi, Utkarsh's parents. We just got to hang out with them in the green room. Um, and so, it, it, and Brandon Scott Jones is from Baltimore, who plays Isaac. So, like, we have a lot of uh, Maryland people in this. Crew I never too. get credit from being from York, PA, though, because that's pretty <laughs> darn close. Okay, <laughs> it's close. <laughs> it's not that far. So, yeah. Rebecca, um, some of the items they showed you, um, not the cocaine, clearly. Um, what you're gonna have to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> She gave me a heady up. Although, for the record, okay. my historian Barbara would be upset if I didn't mention that it was not Sigmund Freud's cocaine. Oh. It was his optometrist. Cocaine. Oh, there you go. Um, was it still good? <laughs> the description was that it was now inert. 
I don't know if, they may, if that makes it good or not. Did you I'm, hear about the cocaine ghost today, though? There was a cocaine ghost today. We were doing an interview talking oh. about it, and the entire table fell over. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I mean, don't talk about other people's drugs. That's all I was saying. <laughs> this building does date back to 1897, so you never <laughs> um, So from what you saw today, Rebecca, yeah. like, what did you learn more about your character that you could bring into the next couple episodes or the next couple seasons? Well, I, I, I did not. Well, we'll let the we'll let the cocaine go. But uh, no, no, talk more about the cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Rich. Um, there was, uh, you know, so much of. Um, I think about this a lot, about how we're now currently, it seems very much in, a, in another gilded age in terms of wealth disparity and and the opioid crisis. And, and I've just been thinking a lot, and we've been talking about this a lot today, how history seems to come in cycles. And um, that feels very, very resonant. Uh, anyway, um, but there also was a female uh, etiquette book writer who wrote a great deal about uh, women's pleasure and you know w women's health and their bodies in a way that I wasn't aware that women weren't actually writing this at this time. And also had a book, I think it was called The Coming Woman. And then she also wrote a book called Hermaphrodite, who, which was one of possibly one of the first published, you know, books discussing, uh, you know, trans people, which I need to now go read. Barbara said that she's going to send me some passages from that. But anyway, like, women were doing a lot of interesting, very contradictory things at that time. I mean, the suffragists were obviously fighting for the right to vote, and then someone like my character really did not think it was appropriate at all. And you know, a lot of black women were also, you know, agitating for the right to vote, and who would not then see that right for many, 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 many years years later. And of course, that is resonant for us with our, you know, relationship in the voting story. So did I answer the question remotely? Absolutely. <laughs> but the cocaine, um, <laughs> it's inert, man. <laughs> it's inert. <laughs> so Asher, um, you know, I think of all the ghosts, um, you're probably the only character that most of us, you know, was in our lifetime. Um, so Approaching that character, and, uh, and based on what you saw at the library today, um, you know, because if, you, you know, they could all kind of live up to history. You actually have to base something of what we are all familiar with, um, whether what's happening on Wall Street, what's happening, you know, everywhere else. Um, how did you give this character so much heart? Oh, well, that's very sweet. Thank you for that. Um, the uh, uh, yeah, it's it's funny to to see all these historical relics and I'm like oh yeah I saw that when I remember that article I I when that first came out I saw that um <laughs> it, you know the uh it's a weird thing cuz the the generation that I grew when I was like 13 that I grew up like looking up to was Trevor's generation um so there is this 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 proximity you're talking about the good news about that is that um it, it can it's very relatable it's still, you know, it's, it's, it sets the tone for a lot of the things happening right now. But it, it relates back to times prior. We were just talking today how similar the 1890s and the 1990s were, you know, and, and when what they were both setting but up. Old for. money and new money. Old and money and yeah. new money. Yeah, no, it's not that they would get along. It's just that they were similar. And... You know we get along. Oh, we, we, we get along. <laughs> But it's a testament to what you guys created here. I had no, I did not understand what today was gonna be. And when people said, ghosts going to the Library of Congress, I was like, there's a mistake. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but what you do here is amazing. And we've all just been like wide-eyed, uh, like, like, like flabbergasted at this. And something that we all love about our show is that in order for us to keep the stories going forward, we always go back in time. We use flashbacks to see what's happening in the present moment through a new lens. And that's what you guys do here. So uh, the whole day, I just I want to thank you uh, for having us. This and is all of amazing. the curators. I mean, all the people that like dug into the show and the history of the show. Yeah, incredible. Speaking of flashbacks and digging, so I think one of the charming things about the show is how it does flashback, and we find out how you all died, and you know all the things that led up to each one, and, and each character is almost like fish out of water 
in each kind of generation when each person is dying. Um, if you had to go back in time and pick a, you know, an era to live in, not a Taylor Swift era, but you know, an era <laughs> in history, um, which one would you select? Well, first of all, time travel don't really work well for black people, but, um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's a little rough the farther back you get. But I have to say, I said this on uh, Instagram recently. Okay, this is going to be so off. I was at an award show, right? And they're doing the in memoriam. And they show Harry Belafonte. And I was like, man, this man was fine. <laughs> like, what? And so I don't know if I technically... I probably would have been a little fast if I was during the Civil Rights Movement, because those men were fine. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, oh my gosh. <laughs> Huey P. Newton, child, they would have had me at the back and the front of that bus. I would have been all over the place. Okay. So yeah, maybe a little Civil Rights. Maybe a little Selma walking the bridge, you know. <laughs> Ramon. <laughs> It's Baby, <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's saying this in front of her mom. <laughs> and her husband. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Listen, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man. Um, geez, how do I respond to that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I feel it similarly. I'm just like, I don't know. Like it depends you like do? time travel time travel where? Like if I can go to different areas, maybe the Americas are have an interesting past with my uh with my ancestors. Um, same both sides. <laughs> so um yeah, that's a good question. Anyone else want to take this first? Yeah, uh, as a white man, I can time travel anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Soundbite. <laughs> Richie, I wish I really wish you butt in like without without even try. Oh, <laughs> it has made me really realize there is safety in time travel for white people. Michael J. Fox was, he knew what he was doing. <laughs> like, I can go anywhere. I put on this vest and go anywhere the hell I want. I should say, though, that's what the show does very well. I mean, we, we can laugh about it, but it, it, there are real consequences if we had to, you know, the three of us had to go back in time. Um, I think that's an interesting point that our show does, is like we bring people in through comedy and then we are able to dive into some serious topics. Like, Something I just real quick wanted to talk about. This is so off topic, but um, we started the cur the, the curity tables with Sasapis, and we ended with Trevor. Yeah. And an inter interesting thing was talking about Wall Street with Trevor, and talking about you know that area and FIDI and financial district, and we're talking about Broad Street and all these Pearl Street, and we're talking about m stock exchange and all this stuff. And a lot of people don't know where those streets got their names from. Like, Wall Street came because of the time when the Dutch stole Manhattan away from the Lenape. They built a wall so that the Lenape couldn't come back into their homelands. And, they, and there was a whole, like, a lot of war and massacres and all this stuff happening. And, and all those names, Broad Street, Pearl Street, Broadway. Broadway was, was the trading path for... Um, the, the Lenape and, and, and the Dutch. So it's like so interesting to see that connection between Sass and Trevor. And I think we got to dive more into that. And like, and, and how can we talk about those difficult topics is through humor and through laughing. And I think that's the way we heal is through comedy. Yeah. There's, there's something, I think it's one of the, the best jokes that we have on the show, which is uh, Hetty's relationship with the Irish, which, <laughs> has a deep history in this country. It's just not something that we're, you know, yeah. anyone's really worrying about today. But it's, it's a perfect example of what Ramon's talking about. Y you set up something in the past that we can all agree on and feel comfortable like, oh, <laughs> look at these idiot clowns. They don't know anything. And in doing so, we come together and then, you know, maybe there's a little voice in the back of your head saying, oh, I wonder in a few years what what perspectives I have that may not be so uh, on, you know, on the mark. So I think that's something else the show does. It's, we're not out here trying to send any messages, but it's just a natural um, 
outflow of, of the concept, which is so creative for the show. We should give a shout out too to our showrunners, Joe Port and Joe Wiseman, who, yes. couldn't, who couldn't be here tonight, along with like a bunch of our cast. But like the showrunners and our writers' room, th 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 look, what you guys just watched is a 22 minute episode. Sometimes it's 21 minutes. That is so short. And like, you know, with it fills the half hour with commercials, but to to pull off what they're able to pull off in many of these episodes, which is like hard comedy and then like a, a very sweet moment that can get emotional, it's very tricky in that short time period. And they do it really well, I think. Speaking of your showrunners, um, just because, you know, there's a lot of critical people out there. Do you use historical advisors to make sure that, you know, you're you're accurate when it, portraying your characters? Uh, hey, Richie, you want to take this one? Yeah, as the white man on the show, uh, <laughs> No, you go ahead, Roma. Oh, man, we planned that. It was great. Um, um, actually, yeah, so we have a uh, Lenape consultant by the name of Joe Baker, who is um, the executive director of the Lenape Center in New York. And, and we work with uh, members of the Delaware tribes, including Jim Rementer, who helped with language for um, a, a couple episodes, which has been really great. And having that resource has been very amazing for me because as, as an actor, so I'm, I'm mixed. So I'm, I'm uh, Native American, Mexican, uh, Japanese, Taiwanese of dis descent, and it's complicated. But um, a lot of the time when you show up as a person of color, um, actor you are hired as an actor you're hired as a consultant and you're hired as all these things and I'm like I'm not Lenape and I don't and I'm not a uh, uh, I'm not educated in Lenape language or in the history and you know I know a little bit but I, I I'm not a consultant so the fact that Joe Port and Joe Wiseman brought in Joe Baker who was uh, a friend of a friend of mine it, it it has alleviated so much stress and 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 worry from my end so I can just show up as an actor and and it's been a dream because this show could be problematic yeah. because we are diving into some really difficult history, yeah. but because there's been such care and um, just such love for these characters and for the, uh, I don't know, just, just the plot lines and everything, it's just, just taken so much stress off of me and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. So yeah, Joe Baker's been fantastic. Uh, Yvette Kassan, I want to give a huge shout out to, is my vocal coach on this show. And um, I had taken a very long 12 year hiatus from singing. And so I remember when I got this, the audition for this, I was like, she sings, I can't do it. And uh, my agent said, well, you know, try it, see what happens. And when I booked it, I was like, the first thing I want is a vocal coach because I had harmed my voice many years ago and I didn't want to do that on the series. And she sung with uh, Whitney Houston and Luther Vandross and Patti LaBelle, and she's an incredible jazz singer. And so getting that specificity, especially from the 1920s, which was a beautiful time in the Harlem Renaissance for black artists and artistry and singers and poets and I mean, I really feel like that was the first kind of version of black power. Um, it was important for me to have uh, someone who knows jazz really well and to portray it accurately. Yeah. All right. So Asher alluded to this. Um, there's so much growth in many of these characters. It's, I think of all of you, it's probably Hetty's character. Um, as we were talking about, you know, her treatment of Irish folks and um, and the help. Um, and so how? How do you think that camaraderie between all the female characters help her? I mean, I, I think specifically the relationship between the, the women in the house and, and Rose McIver's character, Samantha, as well, has been very influential and is, and is um, you know, I, I, they've seeded so many brilliant little storylines. When I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when Danielle and I first heard oh, by the way, your son is Alberta's murderer. I thought, well, geez, how, how am I going to reverse engineer two years, two seasons of choices into someone that would have also kept that secret and done that? But in fact, they have seeded so many little things along the way. They're playing a long game with so many of these stories. And while we were surprised, it actually, in retrospect, made so much sense to me. Why we would have been immediately friendly, because I had a horrible sense of guilt towards you. Because, we, you know, so many things made so much sense. But, but understanding that, that women should have the right to vote, you know, understanding that women can have you know, uh, right to take pleasure in their own bodies from flower. And, you know, also Hetty has a, remember, she's Samantha's great, 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 great aunt. Yeah. Um, 
And so she has a real investment in Sam's happiness and well-being and has a whole lot of persnickety things to say about it. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the reason for that is that Hetty has had to spend generations, uh, you know, many, many years in this house, watching generations of her own family, you know, be miserable. And so Samantha is her chance to, you know, to break that cycle, I think, a little bit. Will um, we see Hetty's husband come back? I, I don't think we can get rid of him. <laughs> I mean, we tried, but yeah, yeah. Um, Richard, I think um, your character, I feel like is the more, uh, I guess, the conscience of the group. Um, how do you portray- His the character, yeah. not Richie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Richie's crazy. <laughs> I did all of that cocaine backstage. <laughs> You've been, um, you have an interesting storyline this season. Yeah. Your, um, your ex-wife is back. Yeah. Um, there's um, some feelings um, developing from um, you know who here. Um, how is he gonna maneuver his way around the house with all this? Well. That you could say. It's, it, yeah, it's very, I will say, I guess I can tease that we, like, we find out huge news about Pete at the end of this season. Ooh. That totally, <laughs> I mean, for real. And I'm not even being like that person that's like teasing something. I'm like, no, it's like, it's, uh, we find out like a massive revelation about the character that really changes not only, I think, his outlook on his afterlife, but his uh, ability to seek out God, it's so hard to talk about this. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm watching, smiling. I'm like, all right, how's he gonna do this? But I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the final, we were just talking backstage. I think the final four episodes of this season are the best four episodes we've made of the show. Wow. And there are so many giant storylines that come, come together and, and go in very different directions than the audience would ever expect. And I'm so excited about it, not only, uh, I mean, selfishly I'm excited about what happens with Pete this season because it opens up a world of possibilities for the character. And we get to see a little bit of that in the final couple episodes. But, but there's, there's gonna be so much more of it in future seasons, which I'm just, I'm thrilled about. Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, so the, having Carol back sucks for Pete, right? Like, <laughs> he, he doesn't want her there. She's stifling the energy in the house for him and he, he doesn't want this, you know? Um, but I think we see like major redemption for Pete uh, at the end of the season. So, yeah. Do you know people are calling us online Palberta? <laughs> <laughs> that's the hashtag that's going around, Palberta. That's really good. I love that. Palberta. I want to, I just want to hop in. The, um, these next four episodes are fantastic. And something that uh, we work with a crew in Montreal who's amazing, like they're really amazing. And something that I, I, I don't know if this would ever be known by anyone unless we say it, is that because of the strike, we had to shoot in Montreal in the coldest months of the year. And our show tends to shoot outdoors quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't possible this time, as you can imagine. Our crew, our set designer, especially Zoe Sakularopolo, um, built these sets that are exterior sets, um, wow. but we're inside this studio. And they are you, this, the, the movie making magic that's happening with green screens and these sets, and they're going up in a day and going down in a day, and then we're building another one on top of it. What they did in the last four episodes is incredible. Uh, and we're very, very lucky to have uh, our crew. Um, so excited for you guys to see these last episodes. We're gonna have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So if we're gonna have you write it down on cards, just raise your hand and a wonderful Library of Congress staff member will bring down a card for you and just write it down and then they'll give it to me. Um, while we're doing that, um, so um, let's talk about the ghosts that are not here. Yeah, um, please. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, nice. Let's talk about Brandon who plays Isaac. And, you know, we were thinking the reason he's not here is because we have Alexander Hamilton's papers. So. <laughs> yup. Yeah. yeah, he refused. He was like, burn them or I'm not showing up. <laughs> and you guys wouldn't burn them? <laughs> Weird. What have you learned from the other characters' um, history um, that you think that you've learned just from your person that you could adapt to your personal lives? Sorry, you mean today? And yes. Uh, Wait, learn, learn from their history? Yes. Oh, 
Have we learned anything from their eyes? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good Today? question. That you can, you know, that you, you that you're just using, like, like like over the the span of shooting the show, kind exactly. of thing. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Well, who's not here? <laughs> um, Brandon. That we could use in our own Sheila. lives. Exactly. You know, like they've all like the five of you have had very transitional. Um, I would know, say growth. with Flower, uh, played by my bestie Sheila Carrasco, um, she is such an incredible actor and so nuanced and for flower in particular what i've learned over the last couple of seasons is just how she loves unconditionally beyond people's faults and failures she just blindly loves and i think that's just something that we all should take in a little bit more especially in during these times and I just think Sheila is the best. And we're on hiatus right now, so that's why a lot of us uh, couldn't be here. But she's incredible, and I just I, I learned so much from her daily, watching her on set. And Thorfinn's grown a lot, too. Yeah, and he always talking about my hat, but that's yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> he has. He's all, Devin, is, Devin Chandler Long is also about to be a dad any day now, so yeah. that's why yeah. he's not here with us. As well as uh, Rose McIver is Rose gonna be McIver. a mom real soon, yeah. too, so yeah. Uh, so many of them wanted to travel and have been texting us all day, like, how is it? How's it going? So they say hello, guys, and, and are sad they can't be here. Speaking of Flower, um, from a couple episodes ago, we saw, we heard her voice um, in a well. What, um, will we see Flower again? And um, if she's in the well, who got essed off at the end of season two? I, I'm, none of us are gonna answer any of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but what I will tell you is that the the um, resolution of this missing flower storyline is one of the greatest reveals we've ever had. And I don't care how, I remember doing Trevor's pants, everyone guessing about where the pants went and everyone was wrong. <laughs> it's like that. No one, I don't care how hard you try, you're never gonna guess what's about what's about, what's coming. And it, it was probably like one of our most emotional days on set. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, for real, like yeah, that was a true. hard day of shooting. But we, uh, yeah, I mean, Asher, you're totally right. That that is like mm. such massive payoff. Um, I can't wait to see that. And you'll you'll see very soon. So, yeah. so stay tuned. So, um, like a couple years ago, we had the wonderful Lizzo visit the library, yeah. and she said uh, proudly on on her stage that um, history is freaking cool, people. <laughs> after she played James Madison's Crystal Flute from the library. What do you think viewers can learn from history through the show? I mean, so much. The episode we just watched, we had a Negro Baseball League player played by Lamore Morris, who is absolutely a genius to work with, and Jeffrey Owens, who I grew up watching. Um, there is, yeah, he's legendary. And we shot that episode on the first week of Black History Month, so I really felt like I got my powers that week. It was incredible, <laughs> no, truly. I remember I was walking around, I was like, it's Black History Month, y'all! <laughs> but there's so much um, to be learned. I, you know, it's funny because someone asked, uh, how do you see the afterlife now? And I think for me, with this show in particular, it makes me want to live life to the fullest. Every day that I wake up and I can take a breath is a blessing because a lot of these people in this, a lot of these ghosts died young. Mm -hmm. You know, Alberta died in her 30s. I'm 35, you know? And so I want to make sure that I'm kind to others and I'm not repeating the same mistakes that I made in the past and then I can grow from it. And I think that's why audience, this is resonating with audiences um, because we get to see the history of our errors and also our wins as well too. You, you took my next question, actually, for all of you. It's like, what does mortality mean for all of you now, and what, how you perceive the afterlife? I'll just want to... I, I brought this up a few times today, but I think it's something that really uh, just makes me feel so... Like, it made us feel very emotional, and it's not really about mortality, but more about ghosts in general. Um, one of our cameramen, um, Daniel, his two daughters wrote us an ad adorable letter. And this letter uh, we all read together uh, in our little like base camp area. And this letter was saying, um, we love the show. His daughters are like, I don't know, six and eight. And his, his, his daughters wrote, oh my God, we love the show so much. Um, 
uh, whenever we went to sleep, downstairs would get really scary, and and we would be afraid to go down because we heard noises sometimes and this and that. But ever since we started watching the show, we just think that like Sass and Pete are hanging out downstairs. Actually, and it was Sass and Trevor, asshole. <laughs> Beautiful letter, and you ruined it. I think he's just smart enough to know that Pete's probably the better replacement. Uh, yeah. Wow. I just picked my favorite. So, um, but it, it just meant so much was just seeing like at how I wish I grew up with this show because I was very afraid of um, of spirits. I, was, I felt. And I was also, mortality was a big part of, uh, a big fear of my life. I had a lot of like anxiety attacks and I, th I know that we all, it's something that we all can relate on, which is kind of wild to think that we can all relate on a few things in this world. And one of them is the fact that we will, you know, all die. But I think this show has helped me because it's like, can you imagine if it was as silly as this show? Like your afterlife was as bizarre as this show? like. <laughs> I get, it, it could be worse. Like, like I, I think there's something so beautiful about that. And then just to wrap up that other story, but it's just, it just, it, it meant a lot to 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 me because sometimes as an actor, you just never know what you're gonna work on. And this show is such a a dream to work on, and such amazing people, and and for us to impact, uh, especially children, it, it it means a lot. So so yeah, I appreciate that. There's something. I, I, the concept of the show is so smart. And it's and it's so it's just very unique, and I think that's because people ask the show why does it resonate, and I always start thinking about this, and something that just hit me was we, uh, in our I guess society or or in our imagination associate a kind of awareness with the dead, that they know what's on the other side, that they they, they must know something that we don't, and our show flips that. Mm -hmm. So all these ghosts are there, and they have no idea what's happening. <laughs> They're on, like, existential timeout. <laughs> Which I think, for an audience, is very comforting. And we can touch topics that are difficult, because there's a lot, it, it's wrapped in a sense of comfort. Yeah. That was very well said, Asher. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, are you going to change it to Sass and Asher now? That's <laughs> 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 so. I've got a lot of questions from the audience here, so um, also Richie. Sass and Asher, like I know. what? <laughs> <laughs> Sass Asher? Okay, I forgot his character's <laughs> name. Um, Richie, let's start with you, just because it kind of applies a little bit with your character. Um, the question from the audience is: If you have to wear the outfit you die in for eternity as a ghost, what outfit, accessories, candy would you choose for your ghost outfit? Because you have that arrow through your neck um, throughout the show. Um, yeah, I wouldn't if you had a choice that. to wear. If you pass away, what would you prefer to wear? I mean, we joke all the time because, like, half of our outfits are perfect. Usually we shoot 22 episodes. We start roughly mid-July. We go to January-ish. And in the summer months, my outfit's great. Asher's <laughs> outfit is great. It's like, oh, this is the perfect thing to die in. Meanwhile, like, Danielle's draped in velvet. Burning. Sweating her. And, like, Burning. you know, Isaac, what Brandon oh is God. wearing is, like, so oh, hot. Thorfinn in, like, all leather and furs is just, like, drenched. So um, I, I feel very lucky that I'm honestly in short sleeves and shorts because I'm in a pretty comfortable outfit for most of the time. Poor Rebecca, you know, it takes her so long to get in and out of the corset and the dress. It's like a complicated wardrobe to wear. So I feel very lucky in that respect, but the arrow is a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, mostly because I like, I have often, you know, almost really hurt my co-star. I almost knocked Roman's eye out at one point. I almost poked him in the eye with the arrow. So it's, the, it's definitely a little dangerous, but candy is a good question. What yeah. candy? You know what I want? I want Rolos. I want a roll of Rolos in my pocket. I feel like you want to die on Halloween then. So you have like a yes. whole thing. Oh my gosh. Right? A bag of candy. A bag of candy. Yeah, a pillowcase. A, a pillowcase of candy. Yeah. We need to pitch and, that. Yeah. that. And you probably have a really cool costume on too, you know? Like, this is getting morbid though. This is like, well, this is going to be a child. <laughs> I'm screaming. Uh, I'm screaming. I'm oh, screaming. No, Dead no. I'm a child. <laughs> I don't like that. I'm imagining like <laughs> I went trick or treating that year, oh, yes. okay, go, go, go. or I stole that candy from a child. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, I have candy. Okay. <laughs> Rebecca, how about you? Uh, 
Richie just mentioned that you put a lot in that costume. If you, if you had to pass away, what would you like to be wearing? In your, yes, in your purse. If you'd like to die, yeah. <laughs> what do you want to wear? Well, when I like to die, I like I would um, not what I'm wearing, but it looks good. It does look yeah. good. Yeah, she looks good. I mean, it does look good, and it and it helps me as an as an actor very much in terms of the constraint and and it being period accurate and 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 making it difficult for me to breathe. It affects the way I speak and the in the pace with which I speak. And I find all of those things very useful. But yeah, it's it's it is very, very painful sometimes with a long day of shooting. But so I mean if it were me I wear sweatpants every day. So it would probably just be sweatpants. <laughs> I mean be comfortable in attorney. Yeah. And I like York peppermint patties. <laughs> From York, Pennsylvania. You remember? know it. <laughs> Asher, this question's for you. Um, it says, was the character of Trevor written as a Jewish man, or was that something you were able to bring to the role? Um, I, I think he was written as a Jewish man. Both of our showrunners are Jewish. Uh, and it's, it is something that's thrilling for me, because I, I, I don't know that I've ever played someone who was Jewish before, and so the fact that this job, I get to, I get to do this, and, and that it's not like, Oh, he's the Jewish one. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things about this guy, and one of them is that he's Jewish. And uh, I did discover early on, as we're all, you know, now we're series regulars, and we're trying to figure out, okay, so how much, how much does this come with? Can I try some stuff? Can I, you know, uh, I did discover that if I could find, if there was an English word in the in the script, and I could find the Yiddish version of it, that that would yeah. probably make a cut. So <laughs> that was a trick I figured out early. And you got Alberta speaking Yiddish too now. I know, yeah, look at that. I, I pitched that next season Alberta has a bat mitzvah <laughs> because she uses so much Yiddish <laughs> randomly in these episodes. And I was like, I think there's something here. I'm ready. <laughs> but it, it would be fabulous, wouldn't it? It would be fabulous. So I, I love this question. Um, what unresolved issues do you think is keeping your character from being um, sucked off? Well, if this we a, say this is a dangerous them. question. I mean, yeah. Employment hangs in the balance. Yeah. Who wants to take it? Well, I'll, I'll ask this. If you resolve unresolved things, is that what's going to be the thing to get you to go up? Do we know that for sure? I mean, we start the season by saying that we've all had a number of suck-off worthy moments. <laughs> and yet none of us were sucked off. I, I have to say, I think for Alberta, it's her inability to love what she's not used to. Alberta, like me, when I was in my 20s, I loved a toxic boo, you know? <laughs> we thank God for therapy, right? <laughs> she was hanging out with, okay! <laughs> Come on, copay! <laughs> you know, she was hanging around with Al Capone and all of these gangsters and bootleggers, which I actually learned today at the Library of Congress, that a lot of these mobsters were paying for the artists' um, education and their mm. performances and things like that. So I was like, come on, Al Capone! But I do feel like if there is a storyline, which we don't know, you know, about her and Pete, that that could be a moment where she does ascend. So we'll see, who knows? Speaking of the Library of Congress, and based on the collection items you guys saw, and this is also a question from the audience member, uh, if you had to speculate, what type of ghost do you think roamed the Library of Congress? Oh. You know, we're just across the street from the Capitol, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I feel like John McCain's here. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else feel that? <laughs> no? Just like reading, reading uh, over people's shoulders. I feel like th that's what I would do is if I was a ghost that died, I would just like read over people's shoulders because you can't get a book down. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, and you want to continue your education yeah, even in the I, afterlife. I have time. <laughs> When I was in uh, college, uh, my college had a big library, and it was always, you know, you would go to the stacks and not to read. <laughs> so I'm Asher, sure what, what, what were you doing there? I, I can't really get into it right now. Okay. Um, I'll tell you later. Uh, but I'm sure there are some congressmen and women who have probably uh, went out that way. So they... <laughs> 
Oh, Trevor. Asher, Asher. Wait, but we listen, I'll say this, and maybe, maybe this is a little hokey, but, but there, I mean, there are different v forms of what that means to be a ghost. I mean, I, this, these halls are haunted by, by millions and millions of the, the thoughts and ideas, and it makes me think of um, uh, the recording that we heard earlier. Did you want to talk about that? It was, it was incredibly moving, and it was the voice captured on this wax cylinder yeah. of, sorry. I'll yeah, yeah, no, it was a, like a wax cylinder recording, and it was... Um, of a, a Muncie man singing, and it's like one of the only recordings they have of like Muncie singing, and and language revitalization is a big topic amongst uh, you know Indian country, and 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 so to have that recording is is just priceless. It's incredible to have. And I remember we were, we finished the curated table at that moment, and I just we're like just like crying. I was just like, like, oh my god, what are we doing here? I was not expecting this, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was. It was that, so that emotional. felt like a haunting in a very beautiful way. I mean, it was, yeah. It was a beautiful haunt. I think that's a beautiful way to like talk about our show. Is like, like the characters are like kind of beautifully haunting this this mansion. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to think about if there are definitely some indigenous people here, or thinking about the people that built the building, slaves and stuff who built the building. They're probably dead here too. Like it's just, ugh, man, it, it's so easy to get so morbid and like really sad. <laughs> History of this country is complicated. Um, <laughs> but we're here. <laughs> um, Speaking of this country, if you had to handpick someone from history to make a ghost guest appearance on the show, I mean, whether maybe it's the person stuck in a car or I don't know, or another poltergeist, who would you like to see? And it so can't be Alexander Hamilton just yeah. to mess with <laughs> Isaac, right? That would be something, though. Okay, <laughs> Richie, did I take that? I was from literally going to say that Lin Manuel Miranda is a fan of the show because yeah. he and Ukarsh are really good friends. Uh, they were in Freestyle Love Supreme together on Broadway and go way back uh, with like improvised rapping. And um, we get uh, like updates from Ukarsh every once in a while that like, hey, Lin loved the new episode, and he's like commenting on specific things, and his kids love it. So I do think it's like a, honestly a perfect opportunity to be like, just come on and play Hamilton for an episode, buddy. Come on, come on. <laughs> I'm very selfish. I want Queen Latifah on our show so badly. <laughs> So badly, I would love her to play Bessie Smith. I would love someone to be a Langston Hughes. Um, and just, just for me personally, um, I'm in love with Luther Vandross. <laughs> I don't know how he fits at Woodstone Mansion per se. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, my mother played Her him husband out. is here. <laughs> the ghost of Luther! Um, but yeah, no, that definitely Queen Latifah as Bessie Smith would be insane and amazing. How about you, Rebecca? Well, was the question someone from history or from? From someone, yeah, in history. Or, uh, Queen Latifah's from history. <laughs> She's a Queen Latifah part. is history. <laughs> you know what popped into my mind, and maybe silly, but I am a huge Prince fan, yes. and a it, to, uh, yeah. to chance to bring him back, and maybe to take part in our musical episode that we should definitely do at some yeah. point. <laughs> Doesn't that sound great? Do any of you have any real ghost experiences in real life? My grandmother is having one right now. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to bring this up and she gonna cuss me out. So three months ago, in Jamaican, ghosts are called duppy, right? Who's Jamaican? I heard a Jamaican there. <laughs> yes, I see you, sis. Um, so three months ago, she calls me and my mom on a conference call. And I'm like, OK, we need to prepare for her passing. Like, it was big news on the WhatsApp. Call me now. So she says, listen, don't tell anybody this. I have a ghost in the house. I said, Grandma, what are you talking about? I'm on set. I have to go back to film. She said, no, there's a ghost in my house. I moved into this man's house. He passed away in the house. No one told me that he passed away in the house. I bought all of his furnishings because I wanted to say money and now at three o'clock in the morning all of the furniture is dropping everywhere <laughs> and so she is a church lady deaconess in her church called her church sisters they saged the entire house prayed over the house and we're still getting calls that things are dropping in the house and now she's thinking about moving <laughs> and I'm like we got to figure this out with this duppy in the house <laughs> but yeah that's my that's my most recent ghost experience oh, there's recent. more <laughs> there's more <laughs> I think Harriet Tubman is with me right now. I mean, that's my girl. 
every time watching over me. Are you kidding? And I found out today at the Library of Congress, this was, first of all, the AP history nerd in me was living today. Did y'all know that Harriet Tubman was 24 freeing slaves? Do, can you remember where you were at at 24? <laughs> and did it involve four local? That's all I need to know. I mean, my God, she is an American hero. Oh, she is. Look. I mean, really and truly. So, yeah, that's my ghost story. Danielle's sponsored by Four Loco. Uh, that was just, she just made a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Drink responsibly. <laughs> Do the rest of you have any other ghost stories in real life? I don't. I feel like we're we, asking. We get this a question lot. so often, and we I always feel so bad because I'm like, yeah. no, no ghost experiences, and still don't believe in them. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like I have to say this because I, I, I've never experienced anything, but I grew up in what is uh, uh, registered, I guess, as one of New Jersey's haunted houses. Oh, and the story, the, the house was built in like the 1700s, this is old, old stone house. And uh, the stories were that the, go and it had like swampland everywhere, and the ghost would guide the American Revolutionary War soldiers through the swamp, apparently was the story. And when my parents moved in, there were a lot of noise, a lot of noise in the attic. And they went up there and they saw some bats. <laughs> and in New Jersey, uh, bats are a protected species, so you can't touch the bats. So um, they opened up a hole in the roof and stood outside the house and counted one by one as the bats left. And it was like 300 bats living up there. Oh. So, not a ghost story, but that's, you know, as close as I can get. <laughs> well, really good to close be enough. educated about uh, that. Um, this is very timely, and the person actually do, drew a little bit on it. So, how do you think your characters would react to a solar eclipse? Oh my God, Pete would be such a nerd about it. <laughs> Insufferable. Can you imagine the lessons you would get about the eclipse? Oh my God. He'd also probably stare right at it, though. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This blind ghost. For sure. Well, Alberto, oh, go ahead, babes. Oh, I was just going to say, it's interesting in, um, in the Native world and Native peoples because some, like the Diné, the Navajo, um, they, they don't look. It's like very... Um, uh, how do you even say it? They stay indoors. It's it's like a scary thing, right? It's very like it's it's a curse. It's like bad luck, and so my on my on my dad's side were of Akama Otham descent, and the and the Otham kind of and they're near them. They're in Arizona, so they kind of like, you know, they kind of respect them. They also you know, kind of respect that as well, but also not not as intensely as 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 the Dene. But I'm curious if. Um, this might be a question for Meg of, of how the Muncie would view uh, eclipses. But yeah, for some indig indigenous people, it is not a good thing. It's like, this is, this, is a, this is a bad omen. It's a bad omen. So I don't know. Alberta would write a song for sure. <laughs> and it would have like scats. It'd be like, how would it go? How would it go, Daniel? Like, scheme of a deep down, solar eclipse. <laughs> yeah, it would be something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, how do you think? Uh, <laughs> how do you think? <laughs> you were going to sing something, I think? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Danielle and I were actually on a plane at the same time, and, so, and I thought, nah, I don't, I'm not so into it. I don't really care. And, but then I got really, really into it, and everyone was passing around the glasses, and we saw it, and like everyone was changing seats so that they can share the view with their buddy in the plane, and it felt like, oh, humanity's going to be okay. <laughs> and, and it was really cool looking, too. And then a but... door flew off their plane. <laughs> <laughs> Boeing. I'll be real honest with you. I've done a lot of research about the period, but I have no idea what the, in the Victorian era, in the Gilded Age, what people thought about eclipses. Is Barbara here? Barbara? Yeah. No? She's left. All right. <laughs> or if anyone else knows. But. 
I think um, we have a nice, um, like, well, I think we have time for two more questions. Are there, I'm hoping this is from a kid. Um, there's a nice little drawing from Luca T. Wait. Is there going to be a kid ghost or any kid ghost, hopefully? There, uh, We've thought about I think I of? think the showrunners, didn't they actually consider We've, this when they, they were thinking of the new characters yeah. for the American version of the show? Yeah. There was talk about having a, a kid ghost, but they were like, ultimately, this is just too sad yeah. for an American broadcast network comedy. Like, we can't have a dead kid on the show. Yeah, not great. <laughs> Before we wrap up, so I'm going to give you guys a chance, if you can answer it or not, uh, one by one. Like, what's, um, if you could tease anything about your characters in the last four ginormous episodes that are about to happen. Anything that's going to happen between Hetty and, and Trevor again, between uh, Pete and Alberta. Is your car ghost coming back? You know, like those kind of things. So. Your car girlfriend, so. Flowers and weed. Flowers and weed. You, you. I think I'm allowed to say that next week's episode is a. I, I, I'm very, I, it's been an intense one. And you will find out how Hetty died. I then love I, that. That was so exciting. Like, <laughs> can we tease more? That was so cool. I think the episode after that, we find out Pete's ghost power. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you guys have, huh? <laughs> That was amazing. I felt that from here and move I up. I did oh. too. God. I, I can't, I have nothing to top no, that. Really. Yeah, yeah. But you have the best ghost power thus far. Well, it's well. It's true. Well. Thus far. 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 It's a competition. Mm. It's going what to be a competition. What could that mean? There's nothing like the OG, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you put your wet finger in your brother's ear. <laughs> oh, cool power, bro. So cool, dude. Uh, what I will say is the episode we just saw and the next three that are coming up, yes, they are really strong episodes, but I do believe that this is our strongest season thus far. Every episode, we are taking departures of what we normally see with these ghosts. We're learning about the new powers. There are new relationships happening. And I'm always the one manifesting. My cast hates me for this. But I'm manifesting that this is our award-nominated season. <laughs> right? Rebecca hates when I say this. But listen, it's only a matter of time, Abbott. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. <laughs> So, Ghost has been renewed for season four. Yes. Yes. So, Thank um, you. you know, Ghost airs 8.30 yes. Thursday nights on CBS. And if you want to rewatch the entire, um, you know, series, go to Paramount Plus. I've watched all 47 episodes, like many of you. you. So I want to thank uh, the wonderful cast of Ghosts who's been so generous with their time. They arrived at 12 noon today at the library. Thank you, the guys. Thank you. Thank, so thank, you. Much. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honestly, y'all might be one of my favorite crowds. Like, y'all are amazing. Best. So fun. Thank you, you guys all. travel with us? We're going to go have yes. dinner. You, you can just watch us. <laughs>